Hello, my name is Stephanie Elko Thomas, a fourth generation Rusin American. This video is brought to you by the Carpatho Rusin Society. Enjoy! We're examining the similarities and differences between Slovaks and Rusins, both indigenous populations to the Carpathian mountain chain of Eastern Europe. We've had the discussions also about where they initially came from, but by the 13th century and 14th centuries, we begin to have sizable Rusin and Slovak populations in what is today Eastern Slovakia. Now, while some of the Rusins were ruled by Austrian Galicia, as you can see here in the Lemko region, most of the Rusin population was uh, ruled by the Hungarian Kingdom portion of, uh, of the Austrian Empire, as were the Slovaks. So this political overseeing by Hungarian government has been a part of both cultures for a thousand years. And if you're coming from an East Slovak or Rusin background, some of these names, especially if you do genealogy research, may be important to you. You can see on the southern slopes of the border that um, Rusins the gray area you see here live in Sepesh. This is the Hungarian name for Spish County. Much of the rest of Spish County is therefore Slovak, with also German populations as well. The next is Sharosh, or Sharish County in Rusin and Slovak, which is where Preshov is. There you can see that the northern villages are Rusin villages, the southern villages are Slovak villages. Zemplin County, which is almost e evenly distributed between Rusins in the north, Slovaks in the central portion and Hungarians in the south. Ung County, which today is divided between Ukraine and Slovakia. Much of the Slovak speaking group falls within Slovakia today. The Rusins fall within Ukraine. And then Bereg and Ugocha counties, where the northern territories are Rusin, the southern territories are Hungarian. And then Maramaros County, which is almost exclusively Rusin with a little bit of Romanian minority. But leaning on the Western communities, you will hear amongst Slovaks and Rusins both this concept of being from Spish, Shadish, Zemplin, or Uj, and you will hear them share many of the same cultural attributes in those areas, including the influence of language on one another. When Czechoslovakia was founded in 1918, the Czechs and the Slovaks came together in the Pittsburgh Agreement to create this state. But very quickly after that, the third founding people of Czechoslovakia were the Rusins, who received their own piece of property called Subcarpathian Rus, which you can see here, but also began to create for the first time some real challenges between Rusins and Slovaks politically, because the Rusin territory ruled by Rusins began at what is the Uj County, but all the Rusins in Spies, Šadiš, Zemplin were now in Slovak administrative territory, which meant that there were now heavier Slovak influences on these Rusin properties. Um, one of the things that happened was that Rusins advocated very heavily for uh, more control of Rusin communities there, and the Czechoslovak government was actually pretty accommodating in terms of creating um, a, a seminary and a school, a gymnasium for Rusins in Preshov. Um, but nonetheless, the, most of the administrative positions were held by Slovaks and sometimes Czechs. Now, we've talked about uh, a number of things here. We want to talk a little bit more about la language and alphabet, because this is one of the distinguishing factors for Rusins and Slovaks. Here we see the cover of a book in the Slovak language. Uh, what is distinctive about it is if you're an American, you can probably at least sound this out. Why? because the alphabet is pretty much the same alphabet that you use. It's the Latin alphabet. So S's look like S's, and M's look like M's, and R's look like R's, though pronunciation may be different. Here, however, is a book, contemporary book, printed in the Rusin language. And if you're a standard reader of American English, you can't read this at all. Why not? It's written in an entirely different alphabet called Cyrillic same alphabet that is used by many South Slavs and all the Eastern Slavs, like the Belarusians, Russians, and Ukrainians. So this is one of the ways in which you knew pretty much whether someone was Rusin or Slovak is by the language they were using and the way it was expressed. Now often there is confusion today in the Rusin community in the United States especially 
because they'll say, well, my Bubba or my grandmother didn't write like this. And you're probably right. In the 1870s, the Hungarian government passed laws called majorization laws. Their goal was to take their Slavic and Romanian minorities and convert them into Hungarians over time. One of the first steps they made was that they went to the Bishop of Preshov, the Eparchy of Preshov for Greek Catholic Rusins, got him to agree to no longer issue documents or prayer books in the Cyrillic Rusin language, but to use the Hungarian Latin alphabet. And the other issue was with majorization that Rusin, Croatian, Slovak schools were closed. If you wanted your child to get education, you were one of those nationalities, they had to go to a Hungarian school. So now Rusin children who used to learn to read in the Cyrillic alphabet, at least in that portion of the Carpathians, are starting to learn to read in, the, in a Latin alphabet, like Hungarians. And so many Rusins are sometimes confused here because they came from families who from the time they arrived here only knew how to read in the Latin alphabet. And so they think like Slovaks that that's their native alphabet. But as you can see, Slovak alphabet is one type of alphabet, Rusin alphabet is a Cyrillic type. And this presentation here gives you a chance to see the continuation of Rusin and Slovak language dialectically. So you see there's three major Rusin dialects, Preshov region, Lemko region, and Transcarpathian. And by the way, what this is is the same paragraph written in all of these languages. So you can see these three dialects, how you would say the same thing. And then next to it is Slovak and it lists standard literary Slovak, which is a central Slovak dialect, and then East Slovak, Shadish dialect that we talked about that is heavily influenced by Rusin, and then the last dialect called Sotak, which comes from around Humene. And Sotatsi, the people who call themselves Sotatsi are an interesting group. When they come to me, they say to me, am I Rusin or am I Slovak? And I say to them, what do you want to be? And the reason I say that is that they, are, they truly are a transitional people. Their language is 50% Rusin and 50% Slovak. So generally the way Sotatsi make their decision about their ethnicity is that if they are Roman Catholics, they identify with the Slovak community. If they are Greek Catholics or Orthodox, they identify with the Carpathian Rusin community. Now, one of the other things that obviously influences Rusin and Slovak cultures, the way we dress. So here's a little test that I always give people. Here are five costumes from Shadish County in Eastern Slovakia. Which one is Rusin? Now if you look at the four of them and you say you are not, it's number four, you're right, so congratulations. But if you look at it, how dramatically different is number four from the other four? And the answer is it's not nor can you expect it to be, because you see things like dress and food are influenced by topography and weather more than they are by ethnicity. So for instance, if you live in the mountains and you're growing more flax, obviously, to make clothing, then you're going to have flax as, as a material. If you're further up even in the mountains, you're going to use more wool materials. It doesn't matter whether you're a Slovak or a Rusin. If you're living up in the mountains, you're using wool. It's not like one falls in one camp over the other. Or if you look at the design of these women's clothes, these skirts are all long, they're all pleated, um, their winter clothing is all long-sleeved, they wrap their head wraps, their babushka in the same way, all of it influenced by their temperature and the materials affordable to them. Likewise, food. You can only eat what grows where you live. So I always get, um, I'm always fascinated when people say to me, oh, potato dumpling halushki, that's Slovak. Oh, no, it's not. That's Rusin. Well, potato dumpling halushki is eaten by everybody who lives up in the north where they need to stretch the batter, their flour, and they stretch it with potatoes because potatoes can grow up in the mountains. So whether, uh, even if you're Hungarian, guess what? You eat potato dumpling halushki up in the mountains. And in fact, amongst East Europeans, you can pretty much tell where people come from by the kind of halushki they make, by whether it's noodle or potatoes, by what they mix it with. So one of the things you have to keep in mind, we talked about the differences between Rusins and Slovak. Here's a similarity. If you're living in the same territory, then you're eating the same food and you're dressing very similarly.
Hi everyone, thanks for watching our video brought to you by the Carpatho Rusin Society. My name is Stephanie Elko Thomas, a fourth generation Rusin American born and raised in northeastern Pennsylvania. The Carpatho Rusin Society is a nonprofit that exists to perpetuate the living heritage of the Rusin people. CRS does this by sharing linguistic, historic, genealogical, and cultural knowledge. To learn more, be sure to hit the subscribe button below and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Also, don't forget to visit our website at c-rs.org. Thank you.